the garden goes from this to this. We'll take a look back at a visit in the garden in winter and contrast it to all the bounty we see here today right after this. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, just a few months ago, this place felt very cold and looked really bleak especially on the day my friend from South Africa, Keith Kirsten, visited the garden. The temperature was dropping rapidly as snow moved in, but we warmed ourselves with thoughts of the summer garden and some of our favorite plants. Now I have to tell you, Keith has a real eye for design and he loves structure in a garden, something that I love as well. And so in the winter, he saw the bones and framework of this garden. I only wish he could see it today with all of these blooms and vegetables and herbs bursting forth. The garden is really coming together. And I have to say the house, well, it's not too far behind. We got the shutters up last week and it's really looking complete. Now we'll take a close up look at those shutters a little later as well as see some of the progress inside the house. Okay, why don't we cool off a bit by stepping back in time to winter when we took a look at this garden. <music> Keith, I'm so excited you were able to come out here. I'm sorry that it feels like a winter day. I first heard about Keith Kirsten through some mutual friends who promised the next time he was in the States, they'd bring him around for a visit. I only wish it'd been warmer during our time in the garden, but being a keen plants person with a reputation that follows him from Johannesburg to New York and all points in between, Keith saw past the skies and threatening snow and dove into talking about plants with his trademark passion. We, we're temperate where I garden and uh, we get extremely cold at night in the winter. I'm near a river. So the temperatures really drop. So I can only grow things that can really take the cold. Yeah. Whereas in other parts of South Africa where it's a bit more warmer climate, they can grow in a lot more of those kind of things that can almost become subtropical plants. Yeah, yeah. They can still last outside. Well, I think it's interesting that I think so often we think that what you grow in South Africa and what I grow here, well, they're so different that you couldn't, but that's not true at all. Well, you have to overwinter pots and tubs of agapanthus, for example. We grow them out of doors in most parts of South Africa, and they grow very well. This is our herbaceous border, and we're right here. Well, it's actually a mixed border because I've got uh, shrubs, the butterfly bush, and yeah. other things in it, and roses. Because I think any garden needs a good design, yeah. um, a very good structure, so that when the other things, and, and like your winter plants are off, that the structure still holds the whole garden and skeleton of it together. You, you've got to have that framework. Yeah, you really do. And that's what we've done here, mainly with just a few workhorse plants. We've used uh, holly and boxwood uh, and roses. So Keith, what sort of workhorse plants do you use in South Africa? Well, we use some of the traditional um, Northern Hemisphere plants like buxus, and we've used also lots of viburnum. Yeah. And then um, form plants like grass plants, conifers, quite a few conifers that even last well. Um, in the coastal regions where they take the wind, yeah. salt, the salt laden winds and the wind. So they do pretty well as well. Um, and then of course, some of the grass plants and roses, even though they don't look great in the winter, they good structural plants yeah. during, during, the, during the summer months. I think they're too, they're, they're often overlooked and they're very good structural plants. I mean, down at each end of this garden, we have a big ring of rugosa, saravan fleet, which has yeah. very beautiful pale pink uh, blossoms on it. Yeah, and we use holly as well, various varieties of yeah. holly which is a great plant. This garden is all about trialing all kinds of new varieties, even some of the old ones. Right. Yeah. Well, I think trialing is very important. Um, and as a modern day kind of plant hunter, you know, things are being moved around the world. And even in South Africa, we trial just like this. And it's good to find out just how these gardens plants perform yeah. for the gardener. Yeah, and indeed. Just, and before they get into production kind of thing. You know, Keith, the reason I laid this garden out the way I did is that so we could keep up with exactly what's planted where. We well, I think trial plants have to be kept orderly so that you can really you know, know where they are and what they're doing. And I think the great thing is that you can also test the performance for the length of flowering period, uh, how they take the heat, 
you know, how they right. take the different moisture levels or even the dryness in perhaps a very dry part of the summer. And I think that it's important to see just how they do perform before they get grown and, and produced for the market. It's a big outdoor laboratory. Absolutely. Super. Well, I think it's fantastic. And uh, long may you carry on trialing and, um, <laughs> and I'm going to carry on looking for new plants and also trialing back home and, uh, and bring these ideas back to America and maybe bring your ideas into South Africa as well. Well, I want to certainly apply some of yours right here. Now, I mentioned before that the skies were threatening snow. Well, just look at this. This was the morning after Keith's visit. Can you imagine to have a friend from South Africa and then we get a snow? The Garden Home Retreat was certainly beautiful, covered in Mother Nature's blanket of white. Here's some of the images the crew captured during the morning light. Now we've reached that time in the garden where we're making the transition from a lot of the spring vegetables and flowers into some of those summer performers. So what I'd like to do is go back and look at some of the things that were so great this past spring. Things like lettuce, the Granada oak leaf lettuce is fabulous. And it did so beautifully in the color where you can't beat it. And then there's that little Tom Thumb bib lettuce is so delicious. We had a bumper crop of gorgeous cabbage as well as kohlrabi. And the strawberries, well, I can't imagine them being any sweeter than they were this year. Now take a look at this shard. This is one of those vegetables that can take some heat, so they're coming on beautifully. This is one of those plants that I love to eat, but I also love to look at it. So it's a feast for the eyes as well as one for the taste buds. I like to grow it in rows like this because I can harvest these gorgeous leaves for the kitchen, but I've also grown it in containers. It can make an outstanding container plant, a focal point in a bed, or just sitting by itself among flowers. Just take a look at the color of these stalks. It's really gorgeous, isn't it? Now, what I did here is I planted these in pots. These were actually peat pots, which are biodegradable. So the little plants were already started when I planted them. You can actually see evidence of those containers as you look at the base of the shard here. Now, I wanna talk just a moment about some flowers that were great performers this spring. Gosh, the delphiniums have been fantastic. Its close cousin, the larkspur, this one called Imperial Giant, wasn't far behind it. Just spectacular. And of course, there was the little Laguna Sky Blue Lobelia, as well as Bluebird Nemesia. I love those blue colors, particularly in the spring. And of course, the tulip display. Well, it was stunning, both on the cool and warm side of the borders. You know, there's so many correlations between building a house and building a garden. Take a garden, for instance. You have to have the framework and the structure. Behind me, you can see the stone walls that created the terraces, and then pieces of hedge that, well, they really serve as a canvas to paint against. And then you have the pattern of beds and these espalier trees that frame the walls. And then you come into the planting of color lots of color here, largely blues and purples, but we've accented it with some chartreuse in the way of this coleus and these beautiful zinnias. If you look at the house, we started out with a red brick house. Well, we changed the color to the butter yellow lime wash, the red roof, the columns were placed on the front, which really helped reproportion the whole house. And then finally, the shutters have gone up and what a beautiful accent they add to the house. So you can see each of these elements play a role in completing the picture. Now those shutters, I was a stickler for wanting something that was very authentic. We're trying to create a house that reflects American Greek revival style. So I wanted shutters that really work. And that's what we have. We have bifold shutters on the kitchen. So you can actually close up all three of those windows. We have shutters across the back and the front porch. And they really lend an element of authenticity. Well, Rick, I appreciate you coming by and checking on the progress. I just want you to see these gorgeous shutters. They do look good now. Don't they look great? They look fantastic. I am just thrilled with them. You know, we've got these solid ones uh, down here on the basement level and then the louvered ones above. Yeah, which is a traditional application. It really looks nice. And I actually brought something I wanted you to take a look at. Yeah, yeah. So I want you to feel this and tell me what you think that's made of. 
gosh, it's heavy. Mahogany? No, no. Not really? It's wow. actually a synthetic shutter. You're it, kidding. Yeah, it looks almost exactly um, like your Western Red Cedar shutters there, except it's not wood at all. It's all made out of synthetic material. So, so what would be the advantage of of having a synthetic shutter versus what we have here? Well, it's all about maintenance. Um, mm -hmm. One of the downfalls of a wood shutter is it's going to require ongoing maintenance, and you're going to have right. to paint it, you know, at, at various intervals. Whereas a synthetic shutter, this actually has a uh, automotive grade paint finish on it, which will last about 20 years. Really? Yeah. 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's incredible. Now, Rick, I notice on this synthetic one, there's this little metal guard here at the top, just like we have on the wood ones. Yeah, there is. One of the things we've noticed with looking at lots of old shutters over the years is the points of decay on an old shutter typically are at the joints. Uh, and that's because water basically enters into the joints. So sure. What we put is a drip capping, which basically sheds the water away from the shutter. And even the synthetic shutter has a joint, so we want to protect that as well. Well, you know, we've actually taken a similar approach on the, the tops of the columns on this house uh, to keep water from getting down in, into those joints. Well, it's a, it's a good detail and it's a good practice and it's all about maintenance. Say, what about this? We're making some progress, aren't we? This is finally feeling like a room thanks to the drywall that's going up. It's covered up the studs, which behind the wall here has wiring, plumbing, all the things that make the house work, as well as that green insulation made from soybean oil that we sprayed into the walls. Now, this drywall that we're using is not ordinary gypsum board that is wrapped in paper. This has a special wrapping on it that makes it moisture and mold resistant. So it will last for a long time. You see, with ordinary uh, drywall, the mold, that black mold, which can be a real health risk, actually feeds on the paper. And so this is a product that's designed where the mold will not eat it and water can actually flow across this and it will not penetrate into the gypsum. Now, in the old days, what they did is they actually did plaster walls. So in this brick house, what you would have had is you would have had plaster applied to the brick itself or they would have studded it out and put lathing up little wood strips and then covered it with plaster and put the finish on it. From here, what we will do is we'll begin to finish this sheet rock out. It'll have a smooth finish on it, just as you would have seen a house in the 1840s. Now let's go back to the width of the walls here for just a moment. These walls upon completion are gonna be about 22 inches thick. You can see that at the window. It's very wide and the idea was to create an 1840s brick house and to do that, we needed those wider walls. So we built it with frame, put brick on the outside, filled in with the insulation, furred it out so you have that depth of wall so it really feels like an old house. And when you think about the insulation that you get from creating a wall that thick, well, it's huge. These guys have come in here and they've been blowing through the house. They're doing a great job. And they tell me they're gonna have the whole house done in just a couple of days. Green with a capital G has been first and foremost in my mind here at the Garden Home Retreat. There are plenty of little tips that can make a huge difference in your monthly energy bill. Now before you think you already know them all, take a look at this. Air infiltration expert Philip Rye has a unique perspective on the subject that just may change how you go green with your house. We're going to talk about some of the most important things you can do to drastically lower the utility bills in your home. The three most important things that you can take control of are air infiltration, air infiltration, and air infiltration. I tell you that because that's how important that is. When you're building a new house or in an existing home, things that you can take into account in air infiltration is uh, caulking, some electrical gaskets we'll talk about here in a minute, uh, water heater blankets and wraps. Uh, Salo insulation that you can add in the attic, weather stripping around doors and windows. So one of the things we're going to talk about now are these foam gaskets here. Very inexpensive, maybe a nickel a piece, five cents a piece. Um, they just tear off. Now this is new construction, but in an existing home, this will be drywall. This is an outlet where your socket is. What happens is where the wires come in the back here, you have a lot of air infiltration that comes down through that. So what we can do, first of all, in an existing home, I'd recommend turning your power off if you can to that outlet before you take the cover off. But you would unscrew the cover, take that off. These foam gaskets, the insides just pop out. 
the place on there like that. You'll put the screw back on, put the plate back on, and it seals around that gasket, seals it totally tight, eliminating all air infiltration and will completely stop that air. You know, one other thing you can do, this is new home construction, but in existing home construction, it's very important on an exterior wall, it's very important that you caulk this bottom plate down here. So if you have cracks on your baseboards or space, just get your tube of caulk uh, and just caulk that area to stop that. One other thing that's very important is everyone has electrical wires and uh, pipes coming in from the attic on an exterior wall. Something that's overlooked a lot is on the top plate of this wall, where they pull through, there's a hole that the wire comes through, and that is another place where hot air from your attic can come down into that interior wall. Now that we're up in the attic talking about that, let's uh, talk about something you can do to really, really increase the energy efficiency of your home, and that is to add cellulose insulation. The general rule is, is you'd like to have a total of 12 inches of insulation. So if you have six inches of fiberglass insulation, add another six inches of cellulose on top of that for the summertime. You know, build your house correctly, do the things that we've talked about here, and uh, make your home energy efficient, and you can drastically lower the utility bills in your home. Okay, I want to touch on a point that a landscape designer such as myself has to deal with on most projects where there's central heat and air involved. And that's where do you place the units outside? So in this case, we've got a little bit of a challenge. The closer you have the units to the house, the more efficient it is. So we wanted to try to get those units up here very close. So as you know, we've got an access point from that urn up there to the center window on the summer kitchen. So there's a walkway that will come through here through a set of gates. On this side, there'll be AC units, and on that side, there'll be AC units. So what I'm having to do here is come up with a way to make these go away, if you will, using elements from the architecture and from the broader landscape. So in this case, what I'm going to do is once this pad is poured, you can see they've got the framing in, and all the pipes and bits are coming up. This will be a slab, the units will sit on this, and then I'm going to plant a Camellia Sasanqua hedge. It could be any evergreen, just something that you can clip and you can shape so that it doesn't grow over into the units. And then I'm also going to use some pickets, some elements that you'll find here on the property in the way of gates, as well as the pickets you see coming down on the staircase with the handrail. So that element is repeated here. So with those two elements, my hope is that we will hide these units. Now on other projects, I've done the same thing. I've borrowed masonry from the house to pull out and create low walls to hide the units. We've also used forms of fencing as well as plants. Now when you consider plants, try to borrow something that you're already using in the landscape. So again, there's some consistency. That's what you're looking for. Otherwise, you're gonna draw attention to that space. And the idea is, again, you just want it to go away. And what I'm excited about with these units that are gonna go here, these have been engineered to have low noise which will just help add to the tranquility of this place. And that's the whole idea. Welcome to the Design Studio. This is where I take photographs that you send to me of your property, and we throw around some ideas on how to improve it. It's really a lot of fun. Today we have a picture from Cindy in Atlanta. Now it looks like what we have here is some new construction. It's a handsome house. There are a few things that Cindy wants to deal with. One is that she's got an issue with some utilities here and here. Now, she points out she's just planted an October Glory Maple, which is a great idea because it has beautiful fall color. Now, what I'd like to do is talk first about some hardscape issues that I think will help with this. And it will also help deal with that problem she has with the utilities. So why don't we get started? All right, what I'm thinking here is that we would do maybe a picket fence that would start here and come across, and as you can see, that would hide those utilities. Nice post here, bring it across, right up against the fence. This will give us an opportunity to grow something like scarlet honeysuckle on it, or maybe even New Dawn Rose, which would be pretty with that gray house. I would paint the picket fence white, 
and I would also paint the post here for the mailbox white. And then I would use another section of that picket fence right here, just at the back, and another opportunity to use the, the honeysuckle, and the hummingbirds just love it. Now let's talk about some of the plants. What I think I would do, since this is a new neighborhood it looks like, establish me a nice big magnolia tree here. If you want one that doesn't get too large, you might try a little gem, and I would frame the house back over here with another magnolia. Beautiful, sweet-smelling flowers typically bloom in May and June. Now, I would also move in a little closer with some evergreens, and maybe on the corner, Cindy, use a flowering camellia that blooms in the fall. It's a sanqua camellia, maybe in pale pink. One here, I might even add one here, and then repeat the same here. So now we've got an evergreen here, we've got an evergreen here, evergreens, evergreens, and then there's your deciduous red maple. And then under the foundation planting, I'd go very low with a dwarf azalea, maybe a gumpo azalea, maybe in white, uh, just one of the azaleas across the front, keep it very simple. And in this corner where it looks like it gets really shady, I would use a ground cover, maybe a little periwinkle, the vinca minor, and then maybe some hosta in here to add some really rich texture. Here are a few ideas for you to consider. It's a beautiful house. Congratulations and good luck with the landscape. I just want to show you one of my little friends. This is a little bantam duck called an apple yard. And she is only about four weeks old and very anxious to get back to her little buddies over here. But I love having ducks around, and we've had plenty of poultry and fowl out here since the beginning of the construction of the garden home retreat, and they're just fun garden ornament, if you will. But the ducks play a specific role in terms of helping maintain the insect population here. They love to chase bugs, and they seem to rather chase the insects and eat those than eat the feed that I give them. Now, there's several other reasons why I like having a few ducks around. They're comical to watch. They're great pets for children, and they're extremely disease resistant. And these little guys can take a cold winter. Their mother and dad weathered over beautifully up here this past winter. And now we've got about eight of these little guys, so we'll have quite a flock by this fall. Now, some of the other companion ducks we have include a white Indian runner as well as a magpie. The magpies look a bit like penguins. They're black and white, and they all get along just fine. It's just fun having them around. You ready to go back with all your buddies, your brothers and sisters? Isn't she the cutest thing you've ever seen? Okay, here you go. Good girl. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And I'm glad you dropped by for a half hour visit. You know, I love visitors out here at the Garden Home Retreat whether it's you or friends like Keith Kirsten. You know, it's fun comparing some of the plants that we both grow. He's in South Africa, I'm here. He grows beautiful shard, and of course, these gorgeous agapanthus or lily of the Nile. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.